So the title which was put about this pot, uh, farming pot herb and, and um, hipster food was just more to attract the, um, the hipsters yeah. <laughs> and the hipster students, but uh, because I realized it's a very uh, trendy thing now, and I think it's very important for people who uh, who became uh, foragers because of trend, because of this is something fashionable, to understand the origins of wild food and what what wild food was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and. Um, I wanted uh, you to make some kind of mental exercise uh, and first try to imagine what is the maximum number of edible plants we can actually collect here. Yeah, because uh, many restaurants and many people search for more and more species and are interested in finding out maybe this is edible, maybe this is edible, and actually how many species um, can be found. Um, and now we also uh, look at the wild food now uh, to preserve traditional knowledge because we like talking about local food, locality, so if something has a tradition in the past, it means it's kind of rooted in the local culture, it's valuable, it's probably sustainable, etc. etc. And um, uh, but uh, there is a question, can we really find more species which are, um, which are edible, which can be found in our landscape? And also, the general fascinating history of using particular species. And I, was, I also wanted to give you a few examples of how the, the history of these species was uh, researched and how we can access this information. Um, I think there are between 30 and 50 percent of edible plants in any given flora. Uh, I mean edible plants, plants which can be uh, you know, prepared easily by cooking for an hour or collecting it at the, at the right time. But in a given tradition of a given country, usually it's just a few percent. But it's very obvious because some plants are very rare or are rare or maybe are not tasty, that's why this percentage can range from 2 to 10% 10, 10 of the flora of actually plants which uh, were traditionally used in a, in a given country. And um, the percentage of, of, uh, also depends on, um, uh, on, on the fact that if, if in a given country people are willing to eat leaves uh, and a lot of the modern hipster food they are just leaves, yeah. Because now it's uh, we think it's healthy. We, we think it's good to eat leaves, but not everyone thinks that, yeah. Actually, in the Amazon, uh, in most uh, local communities, uh, people don't eat greens. They don't even eat lettuce or cabbage because they think it's dangerous or it's not human, yeah. They, they, there is. Um, uh, there was a case of an anthropologist coming to, to do a study in his tribe and he brought some lettuce from, from a city. And they asked him, why did you bring it? It's not human food. Yeah? So um, there is a whole spectrum of attitudes. Uh, and a lot of the history of uh, using wild food in Europe is actually changing attitudes towards leaves. Yeah? That's why I titled it from, from farming pot herb to, um, uh, to hipster food because during the farming times people were reaching for leaves because leaves were easily accessible, they, they could be easily obtained and, uh, and then cooked and eaten. And then during the times when people had more food they were abandoned and now people will reach for them because, because it's interesting maybe or because um, um, because we do think they are healthy. Um, so uh, I coined the term herbophilia and herbophobia. Uh, I followed, uh, this comes from herb, means herb, something green, and feel uh, from Greek, uh, like many other terms, like mycophilia and mycophobia, uh, terms which were, which were created by uh, the couple of Wassons in the 1950s where they looked at different attitudes towards fungi and they found that in some countries people 
love fungi, collect mushrooms like in Russia or in other Slavic countries or in Italy and in Germanic countries people generally are scared of mushrooms. So I think we have the same spectrum with uh, the attitude towards herbs. And um, the um, uh, attitude uh, towards the wild greens. And I think the extreme herbophilia can be found in Eastern Asia, where people use the largest number of, of wild, wild vegetables. But what is actually an edible plant? Uh, there is not one definition and there is not one answer. Um, uh, we can say that maybe this is a plant which is traditionally eaten in a, from generations in, in a place. Maybe it's a plant which can give us nutrition, uh, calories, um, or vitamins. Uh, maybe it's a plant which is just not toxic to us. Yeah? Maybe it won't give us anything, but we can just eat it and not get ill. Um, or maybe it's a plant which is on the list of edible plants. Maybe there will be such list, we don't know. In Poland we have a list of edible mushrooms, which, are, which can be legally eaten. Yeah? And many countries uh, have, but it's not for individuals, it's for the market. Um, in Poland uh, you are allowed to sell only 40-something species of mushrooms. And some common species are not allowed for common commerce because they can be confused with toxic species. And because of this, um, they are not encouraged to be sold. Um, and, um, my definition, when people ask me in my workshops uh, what is uh, an edible plant, I say it's a plant which you can eat a few bowls of it per week. Yeah? You can boil and have like, I don't know, three, four bowls a week. That this, and you don't get ill, you don't have side effects. This is an edible plant. Uh, and of course there's a question which, plant, which parts you can use, which, at which time, and how you prepare the plant. Um, and of course, like with the spectrum of herbophilia and herbophobia, you would have the spectrum of toxicity and edibility and something which is kind of doubtfully edible, slightly toxic. Uh, also the spectrum of medicinal plants and edible plants, and these continua are, are partly, uh, partly parallel. And uh, I think, uh, before talking about edibility and uh, the history of uh, plant use, uh, I have to mention uh, cooking and fire. Yeah, we have to pay honor to it, because this is probably the, the most important skill we learned as humans. And there is this theory uh, that actually cooking changed, uh, changed us. Yeah, we lost our big teeth because we started cooking plants and not because we um, because of other reasons. Of course it's a bit controversial theory and there are opponents of it, but uh, cooking was invented like fire was invented uh, one and a half million years ago, or maybe even earlier. So uh, it was quite, uh, quite a long time for us to get used to it, evolutionarily. <clears throat> An interesting issue is uh, looking at um, the transition of attitudes towards plants from hunter-gatherers to, um, to agriculturalists. We have this idyllic view of hunter-gatherers as people, know, people knowing everything in the forest. Actually, it's not true. Hunter-gatherers are often um, focused on getting large prey or smaller prey or most abundant plants and actually they, they don't need weeds to eat. They don't. They, don't, they have enough nutrition from from meat and from tubers and from fruits. Hunter-gatherers usually lived in small densities, yeah? so they had a large choice of plants. And um, there are some interesting cases documented. There is a paper by Fiona Marshall who studied a group of Okiek former hunter-gatherers who ret retrospectively told her what they ate when they were hunter-gatherers and then she observed they were eating um, they were eating uh, greens, which were weeds in the fields they cultivated. But before the time when they cultivated crops, they only ate one species of wild green. So there is a transition from um, from eating wild species, one species of wild greens, to eating many species of wild greens. And it's also documented from studying the names of uh, the knowledge of taxa, names of plants and animals, uh, animals, and actually it was found that hunter-gatherers might 
uh, might have had a, a smaller knowledge of plants than early agriculturists. And uh, this is a, a very sim simple, maybe stupid graph showing um, the proportion of wild vegetables in, in, in diet and uh, of course I think that the apes eat more, uh, more, more plant parts than in humans but um, we definitely um, now consume more greens than most hunter-gatherers did but the shift went from, from wild food to, to cultivated. And I also wanted to mention I also wanted to mention a, a French botanist uh, who made this impressive statement um, that uh, actually all the, all the plants are edible depending how long you cook them. Yeah? So if you cook something for a very, very long time, you eventually get uh, an, something which is mildly edible. Yeah? He was a very important economic botanist, agriculturalist uh, of the 18th century. Um, so maybe the answer is 100%, not, not 50%. Um, another uh, thing, another book which I think should be read by, by people, um, you know, ex experimenting and studying wild food, is a brilliant, really brilliant book by Timothy Jones with Bitter Herbs They Shall Eat It and The Origins of Human Diet and Medicine, where he discusses various detoxification techniques. Because um, um, although now we have access to better utensils, better tools to actually, I don't know, cook, fry plants, <coughs> the primitive detoxification techniques were more sophisticated, more diverse. And now we are very lazy. Yeah? We either eat something raw or we just <coughs> boil it or, or cook it or, or bake it in the oven. <coughs> and uh, there are more uh, ways you can. Um, you can also, uh, for example, uh, dry white vegetables, something which is rarely done now, but actually even drying can break, break down some, some toxins and completely change the chemistry of plants, which pharmacists know because a lot of the medicinal herbs are, are dried. And um, now we don't practice adding clay to food, yeah? but if we add clay to food, we actually ab ab absorb some um, alkaloids into clay and we can detoxify some difficult foods by ingesting them with clay. <coughs> yeah, actually, not, very, not much research done with it. So actually, uh, Jones was interested in clay and he mentions a lot of cases of using clay in nutrition and uh, a large part of the book is devoted to potato and he describes the, the history of early potato and um, how toxic it was and how much clay it needed to, uh, uh, to use. Also ash, now we don't use ash for, for cooking. And of course there is a long list of toxins that um, uh, can be found in edible plants. Yeah? We have a lot of secondary metabolites and uh, in small uh, small doses, they are very beneficial to us. In larger do doses, if we eat some plant every day, we can get some chronic illnesses from it. So, like tannins, tannins or um, uh, saponins, they are very good to us for us in small amounts. In large amounts, they can destroy our um, our bodies. Yeah. Tannins can damage kidneys or our liver, and the saponins can cause the break down red cells in the blood, so you have to be careful. At the same time, I think we are too scared of uh, wild food. So, so these toxic levels exist, but actually they are very, they are very high. We still don't approach them, eating wild food. And um, uh, I'll just give you a pictures of plants that were probably commonly eaten in Europe in the prehistory, which uh, are rarely found on European tables now. And actually most of them didn't need uh, sophisticated uh, detoxification uh, uh, procedures. Uh, left is uh, cattail, bulrush, or whatever you call it. 
and on the right is water cultural. Have you ever eaten water cultural? One person. It's a, it, it, it's a, it's a water plant, it's an annual plant which produces nuts. And uh, it's commonly eaten in Eastern and Southern Asia, Chinese Lingjiao. And uh, you have, uh, in China, you have two species, Trapapicornatus and Trapapicornis. And you also have a large number of varieties. You can get varieties, it's like a spiny nut. It's about this size, I think it's what, three grams of, of, the, of the kernel. And uh, we, we, can, we find it in large amounts in um, archaeological sites in Europe. And the, 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 this nut was uh, used in, in Hungary until 1970s, in Poland 1950s. Also in, in Montenegro it was used to make flour. And uh, this is a very nutritious plant. It's, it contains, I think, 12% of protein, large amounts of starch, similar to, to wheat. Um, I don't know exactly why we abandoned it, and, and in Asia it's still so, so widely used and eaten. You can buy it on, on the streets of cities, even in Beijing or especially in, in the south of China, in Guangxi, also in Kashmir. People used to uh, live on it, uh, collected from the lakes. Um, but it's, it's fascinating that people use it here, and it's commonly found in, 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 in sites. Uh, Bracken. This is a, a problem for Britain. Yeah? We don't like bracken. It's uh, carcinogenic. It's, it's a very bad reputation. It's a weed of pastures. Actually, it's an economic plant in, in China and Japan, in Korea. It's widely eaten. There are factories. The whole factories actually devoted to processing of, of jiuzai, uh, uh, bracken. Uh, farmers, I've seen photos of farmers bringing the whole tractor, tractor wagons full of bracken. And um, it's, it's fascinating that we don't do it here in Europe. Yeah, you can, you can get noodles, uh, uh, noodles uh, made from bracken in, in Chinese supermarkets. And the fourth plant which... Uh, so these are plants which... Uh, uh, they, uh, they are earlier than the famine pot curve, earlier than uh, and not so present in the hipster food because uh, because maybe they are from water, maybe they are from um, they are not weeds easy to easily collect, and you have to make uh, some effort to actually cultivate them or or find them. They are very rare. The fourth one, I, I think the English name is arrowhead. The Latin name is Sagittaria, but it's not the other the arrowhead of the tropics. It's a it's a small um, marsh plant found in the streams. Uh, which also produces little bulbs. Um, it was used by Native Americans called wapato in, in America. And again, it's cultivated in China. It's very common. It's very common food in the south of China with large bulb varieties. And this is actually uh, the first documented plant food found in archaeological sites in Europe. The earliest, the earliest uh, finding of plant food. As early Mesolithic, I think, um, charred bulbs of Sagittaria found in a peat bog in Poland. Yeah. Remnants of a meal. Uh, people, people roasting Sagittaria on, on, uh, on embers. And um, so I will be using mainly examples of Poland uh, just because I think um, I know this uh, flora the best and uh, you know, I can answer questions when you have any specific questions. And also because uh, the, the history of use of wild plants in Poland is very well documented. For some reason, we have, we have a lot of data on it. Uh, and uh, the, the, the written documents about the use of wild foods in, in, in Poland can be found, um, uh, can be found uh, already in old herbals, and not only from Poland, but also English, English language herbals. In, in Gerard, we can uh, find a mention of uh, hogweed used in Poland. And, uh, the people of Polonia and Lithuania used to make drink with the decoction of this herb and leaven or uh, some other thing made of uh, made, made of meal. 
which is used instead of beer and other ordinary drinks. So this is the, the evidence of fermenting hog wheat for, for food or for drink. And uh, I also wanted to mention that this plant is not used in Poland now. And actually, that's why it's so important to study, for Western Europeans, to study archival sources, because we can actually find things that, were, that are not used now. If you go to countries where wild food is widely used, and um, uh, you can probably document most of the stuff that people um, use or use, but when you go to industrialist, industrialist countries, it's probably easier to, uh, to look at the archives. So hogweed, no one knows about hogweed, but uh, the, the, the modern name uh, the, the name of hogweed in Poland is barszcz, and barszcz is a Polish word for borscht, for the beetroot soup. So, how did it happen that uh, the beetroot soup is called the same name as, as hogweed? And actually it happened because the beetroot replaced hogweed. Yeah? So, uh, hogweed was seen as peasant food, and uh, beetroot was um, at some point it became very trendy in Poland. Uh, we had one of the kings married an Italian queen and she brought a lot of vegetable varieties from Italy. Uh, queen Bona Sforza and uh, we think this was the moment when, when this change happened the most. When actually it was very trendy and popular to, to eat Italian vegetables. Um, and actually uh, also borage was used then, now it's not used. But, uh, so the name of the soup, also in, uh, in Russian and in Ukrainian, comes from, from hogweed and in most places that hogweed is not used anymore. And, and I managed to find the last case uh, of a person traditionally making hogweed soup in Poland, because uh, usually hogweed was made into a fermented soup, it was uh, chopped, uh, water was put, on, put over it and it was left for two or three days and then it became sour. So it was like a sour soup, then it was boiled. And it was such an important um, food in um, old Poland that uh, we have a menu of professors of Jagiellonian University in Kraków from the 17th century uh, which lists whole wheat soup with eggs served on Easter day. So it was something important. And, um, and then it completely disappeared, only the name remained, very mysterious. So the last person who made the, who made the whole wheat soup from the traditional line, not like a, a new thing that you read in the book like me, but actually, or like you recreate something, but that did it from generation to generation, was a lady uh, in a village near Biersko Biała who died in 1950 and until the end of her days she fermented hog wheat in a jar and put it on the window. Unfortunately she was a grandmother of one of the botanists so he could uh, pass this information. And this is the latest case of, of eating traditional hog wheat soup in Poland. Um, we also have, um, we also have um, a few Renaissance herbals which mention white foods. And we had a lot of economic botany handbooks, uh, I, I don't know how you call it, encyclopedias of 18th century, but even earlier. And um, this is the most important one from the 18th century, um, where uh, a local priest describes the use of different plants and um, also passes information from other sources, but often mentions that people in this and this area use a particular plant and uh, give recipes how to, how to process it. Um, here I want to mention another person, uh, Adam Maurizio. Uh, I think it's a real shame that his work is not translated into English. Uh, actually the copyrights uh, for his works uh, expired last year, so you are free to copy his books and translate it because it's 75 years after, after his death. Uh, Adam Maurizio came from a Swiss family, from an Italian canton, 
who migrated to Krakow, now Poland, then it was Austro-Hungary, and they had a patisserie in Krakow. He grew up, he grew up making cakes with his parents. And he wrote uh, a book which can be translated, the title can be translated into Plant Food and Agriculture in the Course of History, <coughs> where, he, um, where he describes his theory of the history of wild vegetables and edible roots, edible bugs, in Europe, mainly in Europe. But he also devotes a large part of the book to making bread. So it's very interesting, he also wrote a separate book about the history of bread. And because he, he came from, his family came from Switzerland, he was a native speaker of Italian, French, German, and Polish. So he wrote the book first in Polish, but then very quickly wrote it in German, and then very quickly wrote it in French. So you can get the French version, the German version, but not the English um, There are also some other interesting sources. Of course, the wonderful website comes for a future, but also uh, a very a nice book, uh, Startupan's Notes on Edible Plants and uh, an encyclopedia of edible plants of the world um, by Tanaka, Japanese work, very difficult to get, and a few other sources, of course. Uh, I also wanted to talk about direct experience and um, how important it is. Yeah? how much we have to listen to our senses and look around at, uh, in the whole world. Um, sometimes, you know, books tell us something is edible, but it doesn't taste good. So maybe it's better not to eat. Yes, and I think this is the most important thing. Believe your senses, yeah? If you sense that something is wrong, don't do it, yeah? And, um, I, uh, I actually started using um, learning about wild foods mainly from my own experience. Of course, I had uh, a few simple handbooks of edible plants, but um, uh, the history of, um, of my, um, this plot of career of studying wild foods started from actually being a forager, yeah? And actually looking at animals, looking at, um, at the world, what, what, what animals eat. And, um, I was a PhD student in 1997, finishing my PhD, and I decided to finish my academic career. I thought it was completely hopeless, the whole world, the academic world, and I, um, I didn't want to earn money, I didn't want to be part of this society. Uh, I got a prize from the Polish government from, for 100 students selected by some competition, but I spent it all on the land, so I took the money and uh, bought a piece of land in the, in the Carpathians and just moved out. I left in one day. I just sold the furniture, threw out all the things, and just moved in 12 hours to, uh, to the mountains. Um, and um, I noticed, for example, that uh, voles collect some roots and put them in special barrels for winter. And that's how I learned how to use Stachys Palustris, Marsh Woundwork. I couldn't find a single, I didn't have many books, I couldn't find a single, single resource on it, but I could see that both eat it. Okay, I tried it, yeah. And, um, for example, beavers were destroying cat tails, so I thought, okay, this is, must be good. I mean, I knew that cat tails are edible, actually. But uh, there is another plant, Cirsium um, rivulare, which is a kind of thistle. And I couldn't find any information that, about the edibility of this plant, but I could see that this was the most important, uh, most important plant eaten by cows. Like they loved it. When you put cows in the field, the first thing they did, they went for, for this plant. So I started eating it without having a single reference to this edible. Um, and I think that's how people learned in the old times. Very often they looked at animals. Uh, we did a, a study on the names of uh, uh, plants connected with bears in uh, about 80 European, uh, European and uh, Eurasian languages in general. Um, and a lot of uh, the times, actually, the names of plants connected with bears were because it is bear food, not because they look like bears. 
but actually bears eat them. Yeah? Bears garlic, alimusinum, the Latin name. Why, why bears garlic? And actually we found that, that um, scientific studies from Croatia show that, it's, show that it's a very good food liked by, uh, by bears in Croatia. Bears actually wake up and go and eat wild garlic. Yeah? So people probably saw it. The same hogweed, actually many names of hogweed, of Herakleum, are associated with bear, like Ursi Branca, the, the paw of bear in Latin. We first we thought it's connected with the shape of the, of the plant, but actually we found a few references stating that bears love Herakleum. Yeah, this is like the dominant plant food in Japan, of, of Japanese bears. They look for, 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 for Herakleum, so I think it's very important to look at Herakleum. And, uh, and here we come to famine, yeah? I didn't experience famine, you didn't experience famine, but uh, this was another testing ground for edibility, yeah? Because people really didn't have enough food in Europe, people were dying of hunger in Ireland, but not only in Ireland, in many other countries in Europe. Uh, and it was associated with the years of either diseases attacking plants or very heavy frosts, uh, very uh, late frosts coming and destroying you know, young crops in, in spring. Uh, and in some countries in Europe we have descriptions of what people ate during this time. And some of the stuff people ate, of course, cannot be recommended because people were so hungry they were eating belts, eating grass, eating wood. But actually, I was very interested in eating wood, and I went to a carpenter and <laughs> asked him to give me different kinds of um, shavings, wood shavings, and actually ate them, used them in, in cooking. Like, you know, I, lo I love birch and, be and beech wood, we taste. Yeah. Uh, people did it, people ate it. Uh, the same clay. We, we, uh, we have, in Poland, we have what, at least one uh, piece of bread from 1840s, which was glued with clay. At that point, I thought people ate clay to fill their stomachs, but actually people ate clay probably also because they could detoxify plants which are not norm normally eaten. So you would have, you have the whole spectrum of uh, farming plants from the ones which were, which were eaten every day by poor people to the plants which were eaten once in a lifetime. And we have some, I will show you some later, some archival sources showing that um, people differentiated them. If you ask them, they would say, this is the plant normally eaten, this is the plant eaten when there was not enough food, this is the plant uh, which was eaten only during famine, and this is the plant which was eaten during famine but was harmful. And we have a lot of descriptions of people also um, getting some kind of edema from eating raw plants, yeah? swellings, probably kidney failure, things like that. Another problem during famine was, um, uh, was what happened after famine. We have documented cases that sometimes more people died at the end of famine when they had enough food, because they were not used to food. They were they were starving for many months and suddenly someone gave them food and they were just dying. Um, I also wanted to mention another name, um, Rostafinski, Józef Rostafinski. He was a director of the Botanic Garden of Jagiellonia University in, um, uh, in Kraków. Um, and he issued uh, a question a questionnaire which could be called ethnobotanical questionnaire. He made 70 questions concerning different, different types of uses of plants, edible plants, uh, which um, cereals were used, which medicinal plants, which dye plants, etc., etc. And he published it at his own cost in 60 newspapers, 60 titles of newspapers. At that time, Poland was divided between Prussia, Russia and Austria, but he published it in Polish newspapers. <coughs> and this is the map showing the information he got. The dots are places where 
the letters come and in exact information and then the circles are uh, regions described by some, some authors. So he got a few hundred responses. Very often they were landowners or very educated people writing, for example, that my peasants, when they are hungry, they eat this and this. So it wasn't always direct experience. Sometimes the landowners were calling peasants and asking them and then writing it in the letter. And this information got lost. Rostachinsky's letters were, were found in 1980s in the rubbish in the botanic garden, in the pile of newspapers, and you know, in the attic. And now they are they are being uh, being analyzed and uh, and, and published. Um, this is an example of a letter to Rostachinsky. Oh, most of these letters came in. 1883 and 1884. So there are numbers of uh, questions. So we usually have a number. The, num the number 23 was what wild vegetables are eaten in spring. Um, and number 24 was uh, something about using young leaves of cabbage. Number 26 was do people use sorrel, etc., etc. So, um, here we have Latin names. So this is a good source of information because some of the respondents of Rostafinsky were botanists or apothecaries. This is a letter from a local apothecary and he states that people uh, in spring in, in his village eat Urtica Vioica, Henopodium Album, Goosefoot, Brassica Sinapismus, Wild Radish, um, Bindweed, Convolvulus, Symphetum, Oxalis, Cardus regularis, Circus regularis, etc. Um, and um, another interesting source of information where, when we could reconstruct the, the Polish group of wild vegetables was an ethnographic study in the 1940s and 60s after the Second World War. In the 1940s, after, straight after the Second World War, uh, questionnaires were distributed among ethnographers um, asking about the use of wild foods and uh, the organizers got back 200 questionnaires um, and in 1964-69 there was a very organized large scale study of a grid of 338 villages dispersed every 30 kilometers uh, where there were questions about the use of wild food. Actually, there were questions about everything. The questionnaire is 130 pages long. So, fortunately, wild food was in the beginning of the questionnaire, so people were not tired too much. And I think they, they answered uh, quite well. This is an example of a questionnaire from 1940s. And uh, the organizer asked for a voucher specimen. So we have hundreds of voucher specimens so this is a well-documented study. This is a, a sheet uh, describing making lemonade from corn flowers. Yeah? And um, the questions about local name, the mass of collection, names of dishes, recipes, if women collected or men, if children, old people, etc., etc. And uh, why did I put this plant, corn flower? Because it's very symptomatic of fashions. Actually, um, uh, in the use of wild plants, we can also see fashions. Uh, cornflowers do not occur in 19th century sources. They start appearing in the 1940s in Poland as, um, as a material for a drink. People fermented, collected the flowers, they put some sugar, they put it in a jar, they fermented it, and then they drank it. And um, I think it has origins in some fashion coming from a bit earlier, from 1920s, 30s, because we found some information from, from earlier times. But this fashion passed, yeah? So even in the past we can see periods that something was fashionable or often used and then it disappears. And one of the reasons why cornflower stopped being used is not because people didn't like it, people loved it but because cornflowers disappeared. Yeah? So actually a lot of wild food and medicinal uses are associated with the decline 
of plant populations. Yeah? Another trend was in using dandelion syrup in the 1980s. Now very few people make it, but it was very trendy. In these materials, we also uh, found a, um, a common use of polypolyfern, which was used uh, for um, it's a specimen of it, um, which was used for uh, sweetening tea and coffee, or as a snack of ch uh, children. Children would go to the forest and break. Uh, rhizome of polypody and, 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 and eat it. And funnily enough, in Britain there, is, there was no such tradition. Actually, there's much more of this fern here. And uh, maybe because it's, uh, maybe as it is so common here, no, maybe because people didn't eat it, it's common here. Because people ate it in Poland, it's actually much rarer. Um, this is the grid of uh, this is the grid of uh, villages studied in the 1960s. And in these two, from these two studies, we actually found a species which is not documented from any other country and was used as food uh, in one area of Poland. It's Stratiotes aloides. It's a water plant which was treated like cabbage, was taken out from lakes and boiled and served with potatoes and meat. Uh, so the the, the the black circles is the area where this plant is documented and used. Um, another uh, outcome of the 19th century uh, documentation uh, were sometimes little things, like interesting little details about the use of white plants. Uh, for example, this is the map of um, uh, using leaves as base for baking bread. Yeah, so um, I don't know if you have it in Britain, but in many countries people put leaves under bread in the oven. And <clears throat> they managed, the organizers of, of, the, of the study managed to uh, map it. Black circles is cabbage, uh, red circles is horseradish, uh, left top, you can see bread baked with or for the horseradish leaf. And um, the lines mark the, the area where horseradish dominates over cabbage, and the slashes is Acorus calamus, a sweet flag used as bread base, and the blue triangles and blue squares is oak and maple. And bottom left is bread made with sweet flag. Um, uh, these two studies also allowed us to look at the history of using uh, sweet mana grass. It's a, it, it was a wild harvested <coughs> it was a wild harvested grass uh, which was gathered until 1940s. Very very small grains, really tiny. It was harvested between. Uh, St. John's Day and St. Peter's and Paul's between the 24th and 29th of July when it was ready, when it was right. And uh, we did uh, a study uh, published in Human Ecology where we looked at the history of the use of manna grass from the Neolithic times until, until the present. And um, funnily enough, uh, it wasn't much used before medieval times. And we think that what fueled the manna grass economy was using it as a tribute. So landowners required peasants to provide them this grass because it was very, very tasty. So it was like gourmet food. If you had manna grass, you could serve wonderful bread, give it to your guests. But peasants actually didn't eat it much. Yeah? They usually collected it for the rich people. And once the tribute system, the feudal system collapsed, people were too lazy to collect monograms. So these are the 19th century, the map of using monograms, and this is the 20th century records of, of using uh, monograms. Uh, we also found that uh, in the um, um, receipts of the royal court, 
the, the prices of mana, so we could actually trace the price of it, which was usually around 10 times more than, than wheat, around the price of, of wheat. Uh, we can also extract the, the, the frequency of using particular taxa, and you can, this is the memory of using them, and you can see that everything was collapsing until the 2000, and we're forgetting it. Uh, so what about new uses? So we have this year 2000, 1990s, beginning of the 20th century, and suddenly people rediscover wild food, get fascinated by it. Yeah. So uh, they first they reach for handbooks for books which uh, describe the use of wild foods, but they also experiment, and actually we can find uh, uses of plant which are not documented by ethnography or by traditional um, dictionaries of cuisine, etc. For example, Noma uh, and also uh, now other people use the seeds of ground elder as spice. Yeah? Something which is not documented anywhere. So ground elder is an edible plant, was used in many countries, is used in some countries still as food. It's probably not dangerous. But the use of seeds is not, it's, it's a new invention, it's, it's completely new. So we can, even if we don't find new species to use, we can still invent the use of different plant parts. Um, I also wanted to talk about uh, a country which is on the verge of Europe, Georgia, often confused with the state of Georgia in the, in the, in the USA. USA. But Georgia, Sakartfelo, the Republic of Georgia, uh, some people say it's not in Europe, some people say it, it is in Europe. Um, it's uh, located between Russia and Turkey in the Caucasus with a variety of climates and, um, and habitats from nearly subtropical, humid, warm, temperate forests to, to steppes with a large flora. And, um, I had a lot of information that people use a lot of wild vegetables in this country, so I, I went there to make a small study, which is published already. Um, and we found just around in, in one town and around this town of uh, Kutaisi, which is the second or third largest town of Georgia, the use of 53 species of wild vegetables, so quite a lot. And uh, Georgia is also interesting. Uh, because uh, the climate in this part of Georgia is quite humid. The rainfall is about 2,000 millimeters per year. So a lot of the plants uh, and plant communities are similar to Western Europe. Yeah? You can find oak forests, hornbeam forests, alnus, fraxinus, uh, similar uh, perennials growing in meadows. And for example, what, what was striking they eat a lot of buttercups, yeah? something which is a very relic thing. I found eating buttercups also in other countries, also in Croatia. They sell buttercups in the markets as food. And uh, in Georgia, uh, these wild plants are usually mixed together and eaten after 30 minute boiling. So you boil the plants for 30 minutes, then you take the water out, and then you squash them, blend them, and make balls out of them. I'll show you the photo of the balls. Um, it's the size of an ice cream ball, sometimes larger, the size of a potato. And uh, another component of this ball is walnuts. So basically, pchali, it's called pchali. It's a dish made, made of uh, green pulp and, um, and walnuts. Why walnuts? Uh, there are a lot of walnuts in Georgia, they have to do something with it. So they put walnuts everywhere. They, make, they marinate mushrooms with walnuts. They have uh, walnut, uh, chicken and walnut sauce. And they have everything with walnuts. But also, it is important because walnuts are rich in fats. And um, when you consume green vegetables with fats, you get uh, vitamin A. This is, you cannot extract vitamin A from greens without fat. And people felt it. People subconsciously 
felt it, not knowing about fats and vitamin A. And in every poor country, when you have this kind of poor pot hair, yeah, pot hair, which is a, um, just a mass of greens cooked in, in a pot with a more or less water and surface food, there was always some fat. So in Europe, it could be butter or cream or milk, or it could be olive oil. Uh, um, also in Sri Lanka, they have a dish called um, I think it's called malam or something in, in this place where I went and they put coconut oil so there's always, they mix the, the greens, boiled greens with coconut oil so there's always some um, uh, some fat this is the photo of, uh, of a bag of greens sold in Kutaisi in Georgia you can see Lanunculus celeratus and uh, Ficaria verna, Ranunculus Ficaria that's the celandine and uh, nettles and lamium, album lamium, purpureum, dead nettle, and comfrey, they a lot of comfrey. Um, this is Symphysium grandiflorum, Caucasian comfrey in a plastic bag, sold for, for a meal. Common thistle, also sold for honey, also cooked, chopped, blended. So that's why I found it fascinating, because I could find the plants that grow in my country, in England, and some of them are not perceived as edible, even by foragers here. They would think, oh, that, that's not, let's skip it, let's not do it. Um, so, uh, for um, looking for new cuisines and uh, trying to find, I'm coming to, end, to the end of the lecture, uh, looking for um, uh, for new ideas and new cuisines, we should also look at alien species. I will develop in a minute because they are new, so maybe we can also get some foreign traditions and experiment with them. We can uh, extend our uh, tolerance spectrum and just look for these more toxic plants which can be utilized in, in the ways that can be made. Uh, more palatable, more edible. Also, we can explore the relatives of plants we know that they are edible, but maybe they are just rare and we don't care, we didn't care about them. And also maybe study the whole taxonomic groups which were not really explored by people for some reason. Um, these are two plants which I think are, are perfectly edible and I ate them. Uh, but are not used traditionally and we don't have uh, the sources stating that they are used. One is, um, is um, on the right is stitchwort, very common in Britain, in the woods. I only found one source from Croatia, from a handbook for what would say is edible, but no ethnographic source. Uh, but it's related to other, to chickweed and, and other species which are eaten. And on the left, it's other stung. It's, I think it's a very rare fern in Britain, but also very rare in Poland. But, but it has very tasty, very tasty leaves. And related species of other tongues are eaten in Nepal and China and sold in the markets. And some species are, were never touched, never tried, because they are very rare. Some, endemic mountain species, who would bother eating a miniature daisy growing in Tatra mountains in a national park, so maybe scope for illegal uh, foraging, but it's not really a serious um, possibility. Uh, bra uh, Brassicaceae are very interesting. I, I think there are some species which could be developed into interesting crops. This is, for example, a Miyaku perfoliatu. Um, a very tasty um, plant eaten in one village in Croatia only. And uh, talking about extending the spectrum of, of edibility, uh, I wanted to give you the most extreme example. Uh, this is one of the most toxic plants in, um, in Eurasia. It's monk's uh, food, Aconitum uh, carmicheli which is used as a vegetable in China. 
It's called Mu Yao. Um, and it's used as medicine. It's one of the most important Chinese medicines. And um, how it's eaten? It's boiled for nine hours. Yeah? If you boil it for eight hours, you die. <laughs> uh, by boiling it for, for, um, uh, for nine hours, you break down the terpene alkaloids into monoterpene alkaloids, which are kind of not so toxic. <coughs> and why people eat it there? A, because it's resistant to pests. Animals don't eat it. You can grow it, and you don't have to worry that wild boars <coughs> come and, and eat it. Second, uh, people believe it heats your body, and people eat it only in winter, and they, they eat it also to, um, to feel warmer. They say when, we, when they eat it, they feel warmer. And also I think there is a social side to it, because usually when you boil it, people boil it in large pots, and they share it with other villagers. And because it's so uh, toxic, it's creating the feeling of trust. Because you boil a deadly plant, you give it to all the people in the village. Yeah? So it's a creating is a wonderful I the last year my friend Kang from, from China sent me photos from from the Akonitu part. There was, the pot was about one hundred liters and there were people, the guests and everyone picking their Akonitum and, and, and eating. Yeah? <coughs> Uh, we, have, we still have some for, uh, forgotten foods now, which were used by some groups, which also require a lot of um, uh, a lot of boiling. For example, Corrida is solida. It's a beautiful spring ephemeral, which um, is grown in British gardens, uh, which needs a few hours cooking. It's mildly hallucinogenic when you don't cook it. Um, and also there are some ethnographic references of eating hemlock as a wild vegetable, but I didn't risk it. <laughs> uh, not only from Georgia, also from North America. There is a source stating that it was eaten by Native Americans. Uh, marsh uh, marigolds. This is a photo of a marsh marigold uh, from a Tibetan village. It was dried and it was reconstituted. We couldn't identify it because they couldn't bring it to us, because they said it's very far, they make very long journeys to get this very nutritious and tasty wild vegetable. So we didn't know what it was, and then we just put it in the water. They gave us dried specimens from the attic, we put it in the water, and they developed into beautiful uh, marsh marigolds. Uh, marsh marigolds contain proto-anemones, like buttercups, which can be broken by drying or long boiling. But we don't know the levels of proto-anemones in this subspecies or, you know, form of marsh marigold. Maybe it's lower than in Europe, yeah? I have the same observation about Lesser Celandine, Ranunculus ficaria, that the ones in Georgia and the ones in Poland when they are young, you can pick them and eat them. They taste like, like lettuce. And the ones in Britain are much more bitter. So maybe they are two different, uh, different races. I also wanted to men mention an amazing shop, which um, uh, goes beyond trendy food, beyond expensive restaurants, which gives food to people. It's, uh, this is a guy who created like a real empire in Poland. It's called Dari Naturi, the gifts of nature. And he produces hundreds of different herbal products, and one of them is acorn flour. Yeah, they have a, a factory. They buy acorns from farmers, and they they leach them, and they turn it into beautiful bags of brown flour, which costs three pounds per per pound, uh, six pounds per kilogram. I don't think it's expensive for for white food. And they give wonderful uh, flour for cakes. And you can buy it online. There is even an English language shop selling it. So I put the link. It's none of my friends, but I was so fascinated that I could put the link on the presentation. Uh, I think he should get some kind of prize. I think he's the only person in Europe actually mass producing acorn food. 
but acorn food is produced in Asia, again, in Korea, yeah? They make some kind of jelly made of acorns and also acorn starch, which can be bought from Amazon. Um, the alien species, uh, some, some uh, uses, I, I think, are, are still to be explored. We know black locust, which has very tasty flowers, but actually I was really shocked when I saw Georgian farmers feeding young locust leaves after boiling as food for animals, and also people eating it. So actually I saw people collecting the leaves, the young leaves of black locust, and using it as food, which is really, really interesting. Um, Himalayan uh, balsam, I think it's called balsam, uh, ju jewel weed, something like this. Uh, Impatiens glandulifera, which is very widespread, especially in Scotland. The big weed here, very invasive. Uh, which uh, we can, uh, I think, introduce into our menu and utilize it as we have so, so much of it. Uh, the seeds are very nutritious, they are eaten in Kashmir, and also related species are eaten in China and called wild sesame. They taste like sesame. And of course we can experiment with other parts. These are pierogi dumplings uh, with impacted glandulifera filling, which I serve to my, to my guests. Um, another interesting alien plant is Gallant Soldier, Gallinsoca pariflora, which is a common weed in Europe, less in Britain, but in Europe it's very common. It comes from Peru and Colombia and and the Andes, where it's a common vegetable, but not really so much explored in European <coughs> cuisine. Common milkweed. This is an um, edible plant known by Native Americans, so coming from North America, and very invasive in Hungary, and not used there at all. Evening primrose. Made a spelling mistake, and not there. Also a tasty wild vegetable. <coughs> and the last, uh, the last uh, species, uh, the last group of species, uh, the ones which are completely not explored. I think it's sedges. Uh, some foragers in Britain did experiment and mentioned sedges, but I think we know very little about this group of plants. And maybe we could explore sedges more. Thank you very much.